Welcome to the Buy, Sell, Hold. I'm Mark Green from the Cars Yow podcast. And I'm Keith Martin from Sports Car Market. This is show number 24. Welcome to Buy, Sell, Hold, the sports car market podcast. Market experts and car friends for over 30 years, Keith Martin and Mark Green have come together through their mutual love for collector cars. Keith and Mark will take you on a ride into the collector car market, talking with industry experts, helping you navigate your collector car journey so that you know when to make your own decisions to buy, sell, or hold. Buy, sell, hold is all about the essence of collecting. The collector car world is comprised of people who buy, they sell, and they hold the cars they love. Here on Buy, Sell, Hold, Keith and I talk to industry leaders, collectors, auction houses, consigners, sellers, and more who are experts in the market. So, Keith, who are we talking with today? Mark, our guest today is my good friend, Winston Goodfellow, who is an author, a photographer, and a car shaman. Or as I would say, a sometimes car shaman, but thank you. <laughs> there you Hello, go. Hello, Winston. Welcome to Buy, Sell, Hold. Let's jump right in. If you could describe the collector car market today in just one word, what would that word be and why? That is a good question. Needless to say, there are a number of one-word answers I could give, but I settled on disrupted. And everything, in my opinion, has been disrupted. Yes, some things seem to be going somewhat back towards normal. But Keith, as if I have to tell you this, needless to say, the auction, uh, the auction space has been very disrupted. And then when you look at the general marketplace, that too was disrupted uh, because of COVID and all the craziness that's going on in financial markets. Things seem to be somewhat stabilizing. I'm hearing my grapevine tell me about there is definitely some action going on. Uh, prices are down probably 10, 20%. But if you've got the money, there are people that are buying. And then what does the future hold? Nobody really knows. And so that's why, for me, probably the best word is disrupted. Okay, and I've, I've got a question for you guys. If you were going to give a one-word answer as to what the state of the market is today, what is it and why? Winston, for me personally, it's contemplative. And I'll tell you why I say that. Because we've, we've been out of the weekly circuit of car shows and hyperactivity, I've had a chance to kind of look at my collection, decide which cars I really want to keep. Uh, I'm aware that life is short and we don't have forever. Are there some cars that are duplicates and I can uh, leave behind? Are there some cars I've never owned but want to? So I've, I've really used this as a time to reevaluate my relationship with my collector cars in general. And you, Mark? Very nice word, Keith. Wow. He must, he must be an author or something or a person. Oh, I know, man. That was a big friggin' word. Big word. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Mr. Short Guy here, disruptive. Oh, my gosh. Well, I would say unprecedented because the times I feel 2020 has been an unprecedented time when you think about all the things that are coming at us from all different directions. Definitely, this is unprecedented in so many ways. And so for me, especially talking with people in the automotive industry every day, day after day, I'm hearing all sorts of challenges that they're having to face because on my Cars Yeah podcast, I talk to people who have businesses that are being highly affected by this. Of course. I would say it's unprecedented, and I sure hope it's over with as soon as possible. <laughs> That's for sure. Let me give uh, Winston a proper introduction here, and then we'll jump into some of our questions. Uh, by the way, Winston was a guest of mine on my Cars Yeah podcast almost five years ago, so I got to get you back, but I appreciate you being being there for me back in the early days of Cars Yeah. Done. Whenever you want, bud. There you go. Winston Goodfellow lives by his credo, if you love what you do... How can it be considered work? Over the past three decades, his words and photos have appeared in over 60 publications on several continents, and he has authored 15 books and private commission monographs. His last treatise, the critically acclaimed Ferrari Hypercars, was voted a book of the year in the annual International Automotive Media Competition, and over the decades, he has interviewed many race car designers, engineers, and drivers, and he has bought and sold and consulted for a number of of collections. We'll be right back to talk with Winston, but first a word from our valued sponsors and our sports car market team that make this show possible. So sit tight, keep your seatbelt on. We'll be right back with the great Winston Goodfellow. The fourth annual Saratoga Motor Car Auction will take place on Friday, September 18th and Saturday, September 19th. It will be held at the Saratoga Performing Arts Center in the beautiful Saratoga Spa State Park, 
located in upstate New York. Presented by the Saratoga Automobile Museum, a not-for-profit institution, this live event continues to be the premier collector car auction for the Northeastern United States. Proceeds from the auction help support the museum's educational programs and exhibits that engage, educate, and inspire the automotive community. To consign your vehicle, view current inventory, and register to bid, visit saratogamotorcarauctions.org. There you can learn how finance partner J.J. Best Bank and insurance partner Haggerty can help put you in your dream vehicle. That's saratogamotorcarauctions.org. Are you thinking of buying a car at an online auction, but worried about how to make a good decision? I'm Keith Martin from Sports Car Market, and I'm here to tell you about an exciting new product we've developed to help you be a smarter collector. The SCM Guide to Buying Online is an immediate digital download. It includes five questions to always ask and why. Also, how to protect yourself while buying online from our Legal Files columnist, John Dranius, and our auction editors walk you through what you can and can't learn from a photo. Visit www.sportscarmarket.com slash buying online to purchase your copy today. It's an immediate digital download, and it's only $10. Again, that's www.sportscarmarket.com slash buying online, and get ready to be a smarter collector. All right, we're back. So, Keith... Take it away. So, Winston, today we're going to talk about three vehicles in your life. A very special vehicle that you bought either for yourself or for someone else, one that you've sold, and one that you would never let go of. Let's start with the year, make, and model of a vehicle that was very special to you on the buy. Share with us the purchase process. Was it simple or complicated? And how long did you chase it for? That's a good question because there's a number of cars that I could rattle off. If I had to go to the special, the most special of the buys, I would probably pick the 1970 Monteverdi High 450 SS um, simply because there was one of them. Then in 1973, Monteverdi made the 450 GTS with a slightly longer wheelbase. Uh, So the the 450 SS was the first car mid-engine. Uh, Swiss constructor Peter Monteverdi, uh, 426 Hemi stuffed behind your head, five-speed transmission, realistically one of the world's fastest cars, if not the fastest car, 1970-71, would clear 170. Good thing to drive. And a friend of mine owned it, and I had another friend that wanted to buy it, and the car wasn't for sale. But I just kept on the friend quietly without being a real jerk. And it took like three to five years to finally get it out of his hands and then get it over to uh, this other bud who was also a collector. They both like eclectic stuff. And so for the buyer, his two dream cars were the Monteverdi High and a uh, Alpha 33 Stradale. And I actually had a 33 Stradale deal done, but that's that's another story. So we'll just say <laughs> it's the Monteverdi High 450 SS. What, what was the trigger point that had the man sell it to you? What caused him to finally let go of it? That is a very good question. And Keith, I don't know if it was right timing or cash on the barrel head or, or what, um, or, you know, was it just being nicely persistent rather than pain in the behind persistent, but it's just for some reason, the pieces of the puzzle came together and the deal got done. Tell us exactly the moment where you knew you were going to get the car. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm very tempted to say when I took a check and met him over in Switzerland and we deposited it in his bank account over there. <laughs> well, that, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. So this was many years ago. That's yeah. a true story, by the way. I have a quick question for you about that car because there's always been a little bit of a of a controversy on who really designed that vehicle. Was it Trevor? Is it Fiore or was it Frua? No, it's Fiore. Uh, Monteverdi Monteverdi had his hand in it. Fiore was the guy that designed it, and Fasori was the bodybuilder. Yeah, it's a beautiful car. It kind of reminds me of a Mongusta in a way a little bit it's um yeah it's probably a little more voluptuous the 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 goose has got slightly flatter surfaces yeah they're both very very cool pieces absolutely did you ever get to drive the car yourself yes oh it was fantastic was it yeah it was 
uh, Mark, you're making me really rewind the, the memory <laughs> banks, but it was just like, because it's shorter wheelbase and you have a friggin' 426 Hemi stuff behind you. Yeah. And so the front part of the engine protruded into the engine, into the uh, driver passenger compartment. And so your shoulder was literally resting against this covering over the front of the engine. And so you could almost sense the big pistons going up and down. And then when you were hard on it, it was fantastic. Uh, the one thing I really remember about it was not only the sound and the oomph, but the chassis. The chassis was impressively rigid, and it really made a mirror feel flimsy. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. So, yeah, just a stupendous piece. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Do you know where the car resides today? Is it with that buyer? Uh, he had it for a while and then it was sold and I tried to track it down for someone and it has, it has disappeared into the collector car ether. Hmm. Maybe it will arise again someday as, as ether does from time to time. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let's talk about a significant vehicle that you've, uh, owned or sold. It's the sold question here. What was that vehicle you're making model? Uh, what made you decide to finally let it go? Was that an easy sale? Was it a painful sale? Did you have some tears over it? And looking back, do you wish you still had it? Okay. And so this is for me personally, a car that I Yeah. Own. Yeah. Okay. I would go for Iso Grifo chassis number 298, 1971 series two car, five speed, small block, just fantastic piece. I owned it for several years, had it totally restored close to Pebble Beach level, but I drove it. I loved it. And this was back in the late 80s. And I saw the market crumbling. I saw the market starting to crack. And this is when uh, the ESO company was, they were, it was possibly going to be revived and those guys wanted the car. Yeah. And so we did a deal that I thought was fair and boom, trigger was pulled and it was gone. One thing that made it easier was uh, I had a Griffo Targa in the garage that needed a, an entire restoration. And what I should have done in retrospect is I should have also sold the Griffo Targa because I was having some pretty stupid money waved in front of me for that thing at the time. And I knew the market was cracking. And I should have just sold it, pocketed the money, and then gone back and bought it back later. But I didn't. But at least I got one Why of the not? cars. Why not? Why did you? What kept you from doing that, from selling both of them? I don't think, in all honesty, Keith, because I don't think I was smart enough. You know, it was, it was like, I figured, okay, I've got it with that car, but I didn't take that extra step. Oh, you know what? I'd always plan to restore my Griffo Targa. Let me unload it. And if the market is indeed cracking, like I think it is, then I'll buy it back um, at a, at a cheaper price at a later date. It could have also been, they only made four series two Targas. And so if that bet was wrong, it's, it was somewhat unobtainium. Now at my more mature age, boom, I would have sold it too without, without thinking twice. Interesting. Well, very different kind of thought process than I think most people have. But then again, you're a expert buyer and seller of vehicles. So you've got a different perspective here. The thing that stands out for me too, is we've got two cars now that have very similar senses of being. I'm going to put it that way. Powerful American engines in those things, but beautiful Italian designs. Yeah. I would assume you probably like Revoltas as well. Yes, I had, because um, when we were talking about this, there was a, a contender for memorable buy was Issa made one, um, one Revolta that was built to race at Le Mans. And I found that car and I went and bought it. And uh, the guy I bought it off of didn't know what he had. Mm. And, uh, and so I just paid his price. And, uh, and then afterwards I told him, <laughs> oh, ouch. <laughs> yeah. And he was a cool guy. You know, he totally took it graciously and I was very happy. I got the car. That was another one that I did do to Pebble beach standards mm -hmm. and took it to Pebble beach in 1990 and had my judges judge it. I couldn't ha have it officially judged because I was the chief class judge, but I had my judges judges just to see how we would have done. We would have gotten second in class. And then after that, I put it on the road and I drove it. I, and I friggin' love that car. It was fantastic. Sounds wonderful. I love it. Well, Keith, uh, let's go to the next question here. Uh, I'm really curious now if we're going to stay on trend. Yeah, so Winston, <laughs> let's talk about a vehicle that you'll never let go of. How did you find it or how did it find you? Tell us about this car and why it is so special to you. And so this is something, because right now I don't have anything that it, I would say I would never let go of. What's the closest to that, that you've had a car? What's the car that came deepest to your soul? Probably, um, 
probably Lamborghini Countach chassis 1120056, which was the 1974-75 LP400. And that was always kind of a dream for me to get one of those. And there was a butt of mine who was a dealer and a restorer had one. And this was back in the late 90s. And someone had put a wing on it and just, come on, that totally ruined the clean lines of it. And so I was interested. The car was for sale. So I sent, I contacted Dick Merritt over at uh, Department of Transportation and said, do you have any records on this car coming into the country? And the next day, a fax rolled across my uh, my fax machine that said, we have no records of that car coming into the country. And if we knew its location, we'd come and impound it. And so I took that fax down to Albertoni was the guy selling the car. I took that down to Al and just said, your guy's price is too high. Boom. And I laid that fax on the table. And I didn't ask for that. It was just, it was just very serendipitous in, in terms of the process. And so let's just say the price went down very quickly. And I bought the car. And then I told Dick I had the car. I told him I would do the conversion work on it, which we did. And so now the car was in the country legally. What made that car special is it was uh, back in the day, it was on the cover of uh, Car and Driver in 75 or something like that. And they tested it. And it was done for a special client named Albert Silvera. And so when I bought the thing, it was supposed to be a factory hot rod. And so Albert Tony and I did a bet because you could tell the thing was healthy. I mean, it was fast. And so we did a bet. I just said, okay, Al, let's, let's do, uh, excuse me, in the examination process, I said, let's do a, a compression and leak down test. And so we did the compression. And to make it fun, I said, okay, give me the over under on the compression and uh, we'll bet a dollar per cylinder. So if it's, you know, under or over, we'll, you know, depending upon which side the number fell on, we would, uh, the, the victor would get that dollar. <laughs> Long story short, I got $12 out of the deal because, <laughs> because Al said he was betting 180 would be the compression. And the compression on every cylinder was 210 to 220. So you could tell it had been hopped up. And then later I... Um, emailed uh, Gian Paolo Delara, who was then back at Lamborghini. And we talked about the car and he said, yes, they definitely modified it for Silvera, who was a special customer. And so realistically in 74, 75, that was the world's fastest street car. Wow. Beautiful. Did you have to do much else to it, Winston? I mean, in other uh, words, to, to make it a car? Uh, that's a good question. What I did was, is I drove it for a number of months and I got stranded three times. And then what I did is when I knew the hit list was complete, I took it down to Al Bertoni, who I was mentioning was the seller. And I said, okay, Al, here's my hit list. I never want to come back with any of these again. And so he had the car for probably six months. And then I owned it for three years. After that, drove it once a week, religiously. And I always made sure everything got up to temp. I always ran it to to redline or near redline in first, second, and third after everything was up to temp, you know, because I was running it up to 120 when I lived on the Monterey Peninsula. And in those three years, I never took it back to him for anything. The only thing we did was change the oil. Winston, tell us the ultimate moment, the ultimate drive in this car, the one special time you will never, ever forget. Um... There's two. <laughs> well, one one was for a photo shoot, and there was a um, it was in October, and there was a large pumpkin patch north of Carmel. And so I went up there one day and just said, "Okay, I've got this real crazy question. Can I shoot a car in the midst of the of this pumpkin patch?" And they're like, uh, "Yeah, okay, fine." So I went back the next day with a Countach, which was kind of this pumpkin orange. And put that in the middle of the pumpkin patch, and it that shoot friggin' rocked. It was fantastic. <laughs> the other time was probably when I had uh, the former Mrs. Goodfellow's nephew and niece were in the car with me, and I got on it where I ran it from like 20 to 120. And so the kids were probably, you know, six, eight, ten, something like that. And they're like, oh my God, that makes my tummy feel funny. <laughs> Because they weren't used to the G-forces. And so, and that was a very cool thing because as if I had to tell you, tell this to you two guys, we get so used to it that we don't feel that anymore. Yeah. And to hear them have the wide-eyed wonderment of feeling that for the first time was a very cool thing. 
Nice. <laughs> I love it. Well, we're going to take a short break. Thank our sponsors here. When we come back, he's going to ask you about the perfect all-around collector car. So sit tight. Go out today and get that feeling back in your stomach, okay, listeners? I think you need to do that. We'll be right back. I'm Keith Martin, and we're going to talk about Cindy Meidel and her company, Car PR USA. For three decades, Cindy Meidel has been a driving force within the collector car space. Her company has been an integral part of the launch, growth, and success of many prominent classic car auctions and Concord Elegance across the country, as well as during the famed Monterey Car Week. Her agency boasts a list of recognizable clients, offering a balance of public relations, advertising, marketing, and social media, which combined with extensive relationships, gives clients maximum exposure and brand identity. If you're ready to launch a new business or event, or need to kick an existing one into overdrive, call Car PR USA today at 480-277-1864. That's 480-277-1864 or email cindy at carprusa.com. I've been subscribing to Sports Car Market Magazine for decades, and it shows up like clockwork in my mailbox every month. But what about when I'm on the road? Did you know that digital subscriptions to Sports Car Market are just $2.50 a month when you sign up with the promo code DIGITAL50? That's less than a cup of coffee. You get 50% off regular price just for listening here to Buy, Sell, Hold. Plus, digital subscribers receive instant access to a year's worth of back issues and the exclusive Insider's Guide, including the 2020 Insider's Guide to the beautiful Amelia Island Concord and all the spring auctions as well. No more boredom while sitting at the airport or on your flight. To get your Sports Car Market digital subscription at this discount, go to sportscarmarket.com slash digital50. Your order will automatically get you the 50% off. What a deal. Go and sign up today at sportscarmarket.com slash digital50. So Winston, we're back. What would be or is your perfect all-around collector car? Not necessarily the most expensive, the most exotic, the most unique, but the car that if you had it in your garage, every time you went out to look at it, you thought, I'm going to a tour. I'm going to Cars and Coffee. I'm going to take this thing driving, and it's going to make me smile. What car would that be? If I had to do one, it's got to be... Without going super nuts, it's got to be an alloy-bodied Ferrari 4 cam, a 275 GTB4 with an alloy body. And I drove one of those things years ago, and I got out of it, and my entire body was buzzing. Mm -hmm. And it, I care if that was the first 4 cam I ever drove or not. I, it must have been. Because I, when I got out, I went up to the owner, and I just said, I have no clue 4 cams drove like this. And he said... It's an alley body. And it's just like, oh. And it was, the thing was like driving a ballet slipper. It was fantastic. It was so responsive. To me, that's the best road car Ferrari's ever made still, is an alley body fork cam because you were so immersed in the experience. It goes way beyond numbers and all the type of crap that people get so hung up on these days. It was about the experience. And so you were driving this ballet slipper. And I remember thinking, Holy Toledo, you know, this is 80 to 90% of a 250 GTO experience at 5 to 10% the price. That's value. And it was because in terms of the noise and the vibrations you sensed and the way the pedals felt, the way the engine worked and all that type of stuff, it was 80 to 90% of a 250 GTO experience at a fraction of the price. So that would be one. If you want to be a little more practical, I'd probably do an ESO Grifo or a 65 Fuley Corvette. Nice. So, Winston, let's talk about what you do as a writer and a photographer and as a car advisor. How has the market today and the situation with the virus and all that, how has that affected your day-to-day -day activities? Keith, I've been really, really, really blessed because, in all honesty, my life has changed maybe 10%. You know, I've worked out of the house the past 12 years, so that's the same. In terms of advising clients and all that type of stuff, phone's not ringing like it used to. But in all honesty, I haven't been that active in the space. Uh, I've got a great book that I'm working on right now that's a private commission that will eventually be sold to the public. And so in terms of cash flow and keeping active, and I still have some magazine clients, Magneto, for instance, I'm blessed. My life's changed very little. 
When you think about what's happening with the pandemic and the shutdown of all these activities, for you, obviously that's changed your life because you can't go to these things, and especially with Car Week being shut down and so forth. Um, what do you think? Yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm shocked. Excuse me for interrupting, Mark. I'm chuckling because it's like as we have gotten older, <laughs> is it's like okay, so this will be the first time I've missed Monterey in probably because I don't remember the first year I went, but it was '76 or '77. Oh my gosh! And I've gone every year since. Wow. And I don't know if I don't know if that's, you know, if I should get a badge of honor or a badge of stupidity for that. No, it's, but it's a, but it's, a badge you know, of life, you know. It's just um yeah, it's like I've been blessed I've been able to go every year, you know, and run around at the level that I do during that week. Yeah, and so I'll miss it this year, but it'll be interesting to see what it's like. I mean, I've gone more than half way more than half my life, two thirds of my life I've gone to that thing. And so, you know, we'll see. Well, it's interesting to me, this would have been my 31st year in a row going. And Winston, to me, you're one of those guys that for a long time was this mystery man. And I'll tell you why, because I always saw you well before I got to know you and who you were, but you stand out. You're a very different looking person. And I mean that in a very complimentary way. And I always Just think, call me Quasimodo. <laughs> I, I always go, who is that guy? Why do I see him at all these events, especially at Pebble Beach Car Week? He's always here. Who is that guy? And I think for those of us who attend these events year after year, and Keith can test to this because he's been away more than I have, you see the same faces and you start to think that these are people that you know. Yes. Even though you've never really met them, but they become familiar faces, especially during Car Week, because we see all these these faces all the time. So, for you missing these events, what does that mean for you? I mean, has it has it freed up time to work on some other projects that you typically wouldn't because you were preparing to go or going somewhere? Is there is there any kind of silver lining to this for you? Yeah, you know, actually there is. I have to admit, it's been nice to stay at home. Normally. I'm over in Europe in May for Villa mm -hmm. uh, this year. We'll, we'll see. They may, they may do it in October. Time will tell. Yeah. But, you know, it was interesting not going this year. And, of course, us judges were pinging around emails, you know, just talking about how we were missing the experience. That's an awesome, awesome off-the-charts event. If you ever get the opportunity to go, do it. There's nothing else like it. And so I've just been hanging here at the house. But then also I keep in touch with people on the phone and via, you know, via email and texting and all that type of stuff. So the camaraderie is still there. Yes. And, you know, you got friends coming over to the house and maybe you go out and do something. Bud and I are talking about taking his 289 Cobra out for a blast before it gets crazy hot here in Arizona. You know, so we'll... Life is, I, I'm blessed. For me, life is good. It really hasn't changed that much. And I recognize my good fortune compared to most everyone else. And I am so, so, so thankful. There you go. Gratitude is the key. Well, I remember, Winston, I think when I first met you, you were in financial, the financial business, maybe a stockbroker or something like that. Is that correct? Insurance and investments. That's correct. Sure. And then you were, I remember you talking to me and saying, you know, I really like to see if I can leave all this behind and make a living just doing what I love with cars. Turned out pretty well, hasn't it? Keith, I'm, uh, it's funny. I don't recall that conversation, but I'm glad you brought it up because that was exactly it. And it's just, it's one of those things. This should be taught in every single school. I mean, even from grade school, I feel this should be taught is chase your passion. If you love what you do, very rarely is it work. Not everyone can be the world's, you know, it's just like, okay, if some kid wants to be the world's greatest rock guitarist or country singer or, or whatever, not everyone has the talent to do that. But if that's your passion, that doesn't mean you can't be a manager, a roadie, someone who works in the industry, a promoter. There's all sorts of other stuff that you can do around that. And so it's just everyone should chase their passion teach their kids to chase their passion. Because again, it's my accountant told me something when I did the transition. He said, I'll never worry about you not making it because you love what you do so much that if you run against, if you run up against an impediment, you will figure a way to get over it or get around it. And that has been true. Absolutely. Good for you. We always ask our guests for a parting words of wisdom. And I think you just shared that with us, which is absolutely fabulous. And, you know, today we can do things that five years ago we couldn't do. I mean, when I started podcasting six years ago, 
a few years before that, doing a podcast was very challenging, much less finding people that knew what a podcast was. And now you see people have their own YouTube pages that are creative, that are doing all sorts of videos and music and writing and all sorts of things. So I don't think there's ever been a better time in mankind, womankind, people kind, that you can't go out and create something and present it to the world for very, very little money. I I agree. And Mark, if I could interject something over on my website, winstongoodfellow.com, I've got a storefront where I've made phone cases, T-shirts, socks, all sorts of stuff where I have put my imagery on it. Nice. And it's it's just, you know, it's kind of a cool way for the car geek, the car fan, whomever to just say, okay, here's my passion. And everything that's on that side, I hold it in my hand first to make sure it meets both my artistic and then material quality, that it's something that I would want to own. And it's like you're talking about is I have a fulfillment agency that that does all that stuff. So I don't have a huge inventory sitting down in the garage. And so it really is a time where you can go out and theoretically reinvent yourself. And, you know, here we are in this pandemic situation in crisis. There's always the greatest opportunity. Just keep your eyes open and there will be something there. Nice words of positivity for us here, Winston. And I'll remind the listeners here today, you can find his website at winstongoodfellow.com. We'll put links to that on his show notes pages, which you'll find both on the Sports Car Market website and the Cars Yow website. I would encourage you to check it out. Also, follow him on social media. He's got a wonderful Instagram page with his photography. He's got a Facebook page. We'll put links to all of those at Winston's page on both those websites. So make sure you check him out. I think you're going to be very happy you did. And when we're all back out on the lawns, you'll spot him because he does stand out. He's a very unique individual. Again, everything can be found on the website. Winston Goodfellow, thank you for spending some time with us again today. I'm going to have you back on Cars Yeah really soon so we can talk about the other side of it as well. This has been a pleasure. Done. Done. Thanks. Yeah, Winston, Winston, it's been great talking to you, and I look forward to having more conversations in the near future. Done. Thanks, bud. Absolutely. There you go. We hope to have shed some light today on the collector car market. You can listen to all the buy, sell, hold podcasts at sportscarmarket.com and carsyeah.com. You'll find hundreds of inspiring automotive enthusiasts on the Cars Yeah website as well. Be sure to log into sportscarmarket.com and subscribe to Keith's SCM weekly newsletter. You'll find digital issues, insider event guides, and price guides, along with our platinum database, column profiles, classifieds, and many other resources. Join Keith and Mark next week to hear from another automotive industry leader who will help you determine when to buy, sell, or hold.